Aaron Fit from D1 Baseball joins us this afternoon, the day that the D1 Baseball preseason top 25 is unveiled. And it certainly has a Mississippi flavor in the top five with Mississippi State checking in at number four and Ole Miss at number five. Texas is number one, and there are not a lot of question marks with Texas. But, uh, Aaron, I can't help but look at this and go, okay, Arkansas, they lost Cops and Wicklander, and they're number two. Vandy's at number three, and they lost Kumar Rocker and Jack Leiter. Mississippi State at number four. Everybody that basically started a game last year is gone. And for Ole Miss, Hoagland and Nikhazy are both gone. And yet those teams are two, three, four, and five. How does that happen? Well, I think it tells you a lot, first of all, about the, the quality of the returning position players that all those teams have. And I felt like a broken record, you know, writing up these teams and talking about how, you know, Mississippi State could be the best offense in the country and Arkansas could be the best offense in the country and Ole Miss and Vanderbilt, all these teams, exceptional groups of position players. Uh, and the big key is can they live up to their talent on the mound because they're all unproven, all of those, those teams. Uh, but the talent is there on the mound. That's the thing. I mean, and you've seen flashes of it uh, for all four of those teams. You look at Arkansas with Peyton Paulette and, and you know, uh, Jackson Wiggins. Those are two huge arms. Those could be top 10 picks, you know, if they click and you throw one of the best freshman lefties in the country in the mix also i mean i feel like they've got they've got the depth there they've got potentially a really good frontline group but they need to prove it and uh the same goes for vanderbilt you know with patrick riley and uh christian little and, and the freshman carter holton i mean all these guys have big big time talent i mean every one of these arms we're talking about uh could be a very high pick and, and an all-american but let's see it now and so obviously we're we're placing some faith in that uh, we've seen these teams in the fall. We, we've seen the talent. Uh, we believe the, the maturation with all these guys uh, is, is coming along. So let's zero in on Mississippi State and Ole Miss for a couple of minutes. With Mississippi State, one of the uh, most fascinating things to watch going into this year is the transition for Landon Sims for shutdown. I mean, you, you call your frontline starter your ace, and Will Bednar certainly was that. But if there was a secondary ace that comes at the end of the game, it was Landon Sims. But he's going to make the transition to the front of the rotation. What's that going to look like in your mind? I think he's going to do great, you know, and, and you don't see a lot of guys make that transition successfully in their third year. Usually if you've been, you know, a bullpen guy for two years, uh, you know, very often we see teams kind of promise a guy, hey, we're going to give you a chance to start. And then three weeks in the season, they pull the plug. You know, I remember back in the day with Matt Price in South Carolina, one of the best closers in the country. I uh, didn't sign as a, as a junior. And they're like, hey, come on back. You know, we'll let you start. It'll be great. And, and three weeks into the season, he's back in the bullpen. You know, it's just you see that all the time. Wouldn't shock me if that happened here, but I think Sims is a little bit of a different animal. Uh, he's been extended before. We saw that even right out of the gate last year at that tournament at Globe Life. I mean, you know, he struck out a bunch of guys who were five plus innings, and it was dominant. Um, you know, in Omaha, you see him. You see him work a few innings at a time. I think he's actually better suited for this because uh, Chris Limonis has always said he doesn't necessarily bounce back that great. You know, from one day to the next, he's not like one of those rubber arm guys that you roll out every day. He needs more time to recover. And uh, I think if you build him up as a starter, you let him, you know, go eight innings or seven, as much as you can get out of him on a Friday, uh, he may be better suited for that than coming back and pitching twice in a weekend. So, um, you know, even though he hasn't really shown you a third pitch to this point in college, it's basically fastball slider. Those two pitches are just so dominant that I don't even think he necessarily needs that third pitch. I'm, I'm sure he'll be working on it, uh, but I think he can dominate just fine as a starter without it. Is the development plan that we've seen Chris Lamonis use with pitchers beneficial here? In that, a, I, mean, I feel like he maybe more even than a lot of other coaches nationally doesn't push guys early in the season. You you might have talking about Landon Sims here. He might go four innings and look unhittable, and he's done after four innings. And it might yeah. be like that for three or four weeks before they stretch him out to five or six or seven. Does that help in this transition? Yeah, I think so. No question. And, and you're right. They've done a really good job of that historically. Scott Foxhall, uh, one of the best pitching coaches in the country, and uh, they, they take care of their guys and they do build them up slowly, like I think all smart programs do. Um, I mean, it would be, there's no reason to run a guy out there for seven innings on opening day. Uh, and you see it from time to time, and it makes me cringe whenever I see it because uh, it's just so much smarter to build them up gradually. And, uh, yeah, I do think for a guy making the transition from the back end to the front, um, that process will be beneficial for him. All right, so let's let's switch gears from Starkville to Oxford. Derek Diamond is a known commodity, didn't really pitch in the fall, wanted to try and get him back to 100% and, and healthy. 
Can he be a front-of-the-rotation guy that is a week-in, week-out, consistent arm for Mike Bianco? He's definitely got the stuff. You know, it's not a question of the stuff. It's a question of the command and the pitchability and and the consistency. And that's the piece that we we haven't quite seen from him. You know, you've seen flashes of real excellence. Uh, He can blow you away with the fastball, the you know breaking ball. He's got he's got feel for four pitches that are all good. Um, Thing is, I don't necessarily know that they need him to be the dude dude the way Mississippi State's really counting on Landon Sims to be the dude dude. Like if that that plan doesn't work out. Uh, I kind of changed the dynamic for Mississippi State. But in Ole Miss's case, I think they've got other guys who could step into that. You know, I, I don't know that there's a whole lot of difference really between Diamond and uh, maybe a Drew McDaniel or, or a Jack Washburn, the, the Oregon State transfer, or even John Gaddis. You know, I know he's not he doesn't have that track record in a major conference, but uh, his numbers last year at AM Corpus Christi were fantastic. And uh, he can really pitch. You know, I, I was in there in the fall and, and uh, walked away very impressed with his polish. And, and it's, you know, it's lefty that has stuff and has feel. So between those four guys, I think you got a lot of options, and they could shuffle them in any different order. You know, maybe because it's his background as a, uh, a catcher and the way that he's worked with pitchers, it feels like Mike Bianco almost gets the benefit of the doubt that he's going to figure it out with his rotation, even if there are question marks going into the season. A lot of times it's like, well, there's some holes in the lineup, and are they going to figure that out? When you look one through nine, there's not much in terms of a hole in this Ole Miss lineup. Uh, it's crazy. You know, I thought last year – um, I remember seeing him play against Vanderbilt, you know, in, in Oxford and, you know, they're playing, they're facing Jack Leiter and Kamar Rocker, these elite talents, and Riley and all these guys for, for Vandy. And I mean, just the way that Ole Miss took apart those guys was, was pretty impressive. And at that point, I, I thought they were already one of the best offenses in the country and they kind of carried it through after they lose Hoagland. I think they rode the offense really uh, in the Casey, um, you know, to a super regional, but yeah, you got everybody back from that. I mean, every notable piece is back, and, you know, theoretically, Elko would be better with a, a two functioning ACLs. I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe, maybe. maybe just one is the key for him, but uh, uh, he was awfully good last year down the stretch without it. But, boy, I mean, you know, getting him back to full strength and um, another year of development for, for Jacob Gonzalez, who was already a first-team All-American, and T.J. McCants, who just came, you know, I wouldn't say came out of nowhere because he was a big-time recruit, but uh, to come off the bench when injuries struck, struck and then become a regular center fielder when he was a, a, an infielder by trade. Um, that aptitude that he showed was pretty special. And, and Mike Bianco said this fall, he thinks he could be a superstar. I was going to ask you about McCants because it was clear that there was a development process that had to happen for him in center field. You saw flashes of athletic ability, but then you watched you're like, ooh, that's a terrible route that he took mm-hmm. to that ball, or the arm strength's not there. Do you see growth with McCants from freshman to sophomore? Yeah, I think both those – observations are spot on you know he, he was not really a center fielder last year and they just had to throw him out there and you know he, he got by but it wasn't always pretty um yeah i mean you know I, I do think that he's made from what i understand he's made some progress i mean my, my look it was only one day in the fall but i thought he did a pretty good job out there you know made a, a nice player too that stood out um but uh it's just reps you know like anything else i mean you, you play shortstop your whole life you don't always pick up a new spot instantly you know i, I think he'll be better in year two out there Give me the guy not named Logan Tanner that you think pops the most in Mississippi State's lineup. Oh, boy, that's uh, that's a good one. Kellum Clark comes to mind. I mean, I'm really I'm really in on that one. Um, I I think Hunter Hines is a freshman and and I don't necessarily know uh, where he fits. You know, is he play first base some? Does he play DH? I mean. You got Luke Hancock, who's got a great track record, uh, but I love Hunter Hines, man. That guy, I think it's going to be a very special bat, big-time power, and I think uh, the swing works. And uh, as a freshman, look for him to do big things. Last thing for you, got a minute left. You do not have Southern Miss in the preseason top 25. How close were they to being mm. in that poll? Really wanted them in, man. Uh, it's That one hurt. There, there, were, there were 10 teams at the back. Um, that we really wanted to, to rank, and there just there's enough room. But for them, you, you take away Powell and you take away Stanley at the rotation. I mean, that's the only thing is they have to answer that question mark, uh, who, who's going to be the frontline arms. But, I mean, the day I was there this, this fall, you know, I think I saw 12 guys that are running out there, and, and I walked away thinking they got enough. They got enough arms. Just a matter of, you know, can these guys be extended and, and, and kind of prove to be workhorse starters. But there's a lot of veterans back there. I mean, for me, they were, they were Team 26. Uh, you know, they were 